Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. Uh, I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have with me uh, once again Richard Mayberry. He's the author of Richard Mayberry's U.S. and World Early Warning Report. It is a newsletter that I've been a subscriber to now for many years. Uh, many, many years ago, I had a, a, a subscriber of mine who I met up with, a dentist who, um, uh, who is no longer with us, unfortunately. He's a wonderful man, but he... He just said, Jay, you have to subscribe to Early Warning Report. He said, I don't know of any letter that is better in terms of geopolitics and what's going on in the world. Uh, and he's also very much in tune with the markets as well. And so I started subscribing, and it's one of those uh, one of those few letters that I don't allow to lapse uh, when the subscription renewal time comes. So thanks for joining me again, Richard. It's always a pleasure to have you with me. Well, thanks a lot, Jay, and I always enjoy talking with you. You're really doing a fantastic job here. Uh, very few other uh, public people uh, have much to say that's, that's tuned in like, uh, like your stuff is. You really have a, a good background in the, in the stuff you report on. That's unusual these days. Well, it's, I, th- I suppose uh, you know, it's brought up in a, in a sort of a counterculture environment, not one of the mainstream, and uh, I suppose that has something to do with it. I mean, people... Uh, that just basically uh, aren't challenging themselves in terms of what is the truth. I mean, if we just simply listen to the mainstream and accept uh, the, the you know those uh, talking heads with silver silver tongues, uh, the the PhDs from Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. Well, my goodness, I, how can you question them? They are so bright, so brilliant. They speak so well. They look so good. Uh, but uh, uh, good lord, I mean, I think the the people that are most lis- misleading a lot of times. I mean, could you imagine the uh, television networks are not going to put the Elephant Man on television, are they? No, that's true. Yeah, you know, my wife and I were talking the other day about the the uh, Ivy League colleges and and how they really essentially control the thinking of practically everybody in the country because you can't get to be very high in politics or in the news media without being trained by these people. And they have these um, socialist agendas that they picked up like, oh, I don't know, those those Ivy League colleges were swept by that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and they never let go. They they can't uh, face the fact that uh, socialism doesn't work and that they've been teaching this viewpoint for more than a century, and it's wrong. And, and they won't admit it. And so they ride on the, the backs of the medical schools and the other scientific parts of those colleges, the economists do. The yeah. economists pick up the, the prestige from those scientific parts of, of the curriculum in those colleges, but they are a bunch of fools. They do not know what they're doing because they keep passing along this this socialist and Keynesian model that they teach to everybody else. How is it that the Federal Reserve can, you know, can can do the same thing as they did in the 1930s? It didn't work in the 30s, uh, and then, uh, you know, Bernanke comes along at Milton Friedman's birthday or whatever celebration it was, and said, mm-hmm. "Milton, we won't let you down. This time, we're going to get it right." Uh, and, you know, so they went at it with the bazookas, right? And they went at it harder than ever before. They never questioned the fact that it wasn't the right policy to start with in the 1930s. They just simply said, well, we, we didn't do it right. We didn't do it enough of it or, or effectively. We just weren't effective. Uh, they daren't, and their hubris, I guess, dare not question uh, the fact. They, they, they dare not admit that they might be wrong, that their policies and their thought process is wrong from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, it's really insane. Um, you know, as some of your, your listeners will, will recognize, you and I both follow the Austrian School of Economics, which is the, the only living alternative to the, the Keynesian and socialist model. And um, I, I think it was, it was very instructive that one of the greatest of the Austrian economists who got a Nobel Prize in 1974 was Frederick Hayek, and almost all of his work was in regard to law, not in regard to economics, because ah. Hayek said that, as far as he was concerned, the economics had been done, uh, that the, the Austrians had worked out what's wrong with the, the world economy. 
and mm-hmm. that um, he felt that, that he couldn't add anything more to it, even though this guy is a Nobel Prize winner. So he mm-hmm. went off in the direction of studying the, co- the connection between law and economics rather than say, trying to say anything more about economics. And, and the Keynesians are still back there using a model that, if they would admit, admit it, I, I wish they would, their model comes from the Roman Empire, they yeah. are they are back there two thousand years, uh, and the you know the Austrian model was was basically finished by uh, Ludwig von Mises mm-hmm. in uh, the nineteen twenties. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, and, and Americans are taught nothing about this. They know nothing about the how false the ideas are that they are taught when they are in high school and college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even the most rudimentary uh, uh, principles of economics, of uh, you know, such simple concepts of supply and demand, or taking it a little further, the elasticity of supply and demand, which are pretty simple concepts, uh, and clearing the market, and 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 finding out that the, you know, the the idea that that markets, if left to their own devices, if they were free, would allocate scarce resources more efficiently than any other kind of a system, and so we have the specter of a few. Uh, self-proclaimed brilliant PhDs from Princeton, Harvard, and Yale who sit uh, on the uh, Federal Reserve Board and make decisions as to how uh, what interest rates should be. It's just uh, it's just inconceivable. It's so Soviet Union like, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was actually going to bring that up. You know, <laughs> we must be wired together through the ether or something here. Well, um, I think we are in terms <laughs> of uh, you know understanding. To me, you don't have to be brilliant to understand. Uh, Austrian economics, although for sure von Mises and the other great minds, uh, you know, really spelled out in great detail and great depth the dynamics of it. But in its simplest form, it's just the way things are. It's the way people behave. Prices are higher, they consume less, they sell more. Uh, you know, so that kind of thing. And uh, I don't know why it's so hard for people to understand that. But the lack of understanding those basic principles means then that the demagogues can start promising. Uh, endless amounts of, of things they can never deliver, uh, or if they do deliver them, that's going to be at some cost to somebody uh, in the efficiency of the system. Well, anyway, Richard, what I wanted to talk about, at least in part, and want to make sure we cover it today, is Brexit. You know, um, it seems that there is, is something going on around the world now where people are demanding more say in the way of how they are governed, and perhaps more decentralized government, I guess. You know, we certainly, the Brexit was a, a move in that direction, it would seem. Uh, there's pressures in Italy, uh, there's pressures in Germany and uh, France, and uh, and I would argue that Donald Trump's popularity here among the middle class, which is, feels they're being cheated, uh, is part of it. Um, do, you, do you see it that way? Is it is it a revolt of the middle class that's that's going on and causing Brexit and other things? What, what's your take? Yeah, I, I do believe that. Um, you know, what happened was that World War II was so horrible that um, you know pe- people today they pretty much lost a grasp of how awful that war was. Mm-hmm. And the people who came out of that war, who, who did survive it, especially in Europe where it was so awful, it was the worst of all in Europe. They were terrified that the world would go back into that sort of thing again. And so they went desperately in search of a way to do something about it. Mm-hmm. And they, they hit on this idea that um, we ought to have one world government, just a single yeah. government that runs the whole world and keeps everybody under control so that nobody will attack anybody else. And um, there was absolutely no evidence whatsoever that that would work. <laughs> Or yeah. that people who had that much power could be trusted with it, huh. but they went ahead and started moving in that direction. And the the uh, the United Nations was the first attempt, and then European Union was seen as a step in a further step in that direction of this unification of a whole bunch of governments. And um, again, it just doesn't work. That that much political power will corrupt anybody. And, uh, you know, the, the big lesson that the American founders left us with and that's been forgotten is that political power corrupts the morals and the judgment. And so there's no solution other than to keep governments as small as you possibly can because mm-hmm. you want it small enough 
that no matter who gets control of it, he can't do much damage. Mm-hmm. But after World War II, the whole world began moving in the opposite direction, uh, trying to tell themselves that there are people who can be trusted with all this power. And it turns out to be a, a ridiculous idea. So um, the European Union now is, is essentially starting to disintegrate um, because the people are realizing that the that, uh, b- politicians and bureaucrats with all that power are just robbing them and, and just, just treating them horribly, which is, a, you know, that's the lesson of history, is you don't ever trust right. any government. But they trusted their European Union, and now they're paying for it. Right. Well, it would be a little bit, I guess, when we ask governments, uh, to take care of us, it's a little bit like asking the fox to guard the chicken coop. Yeah. Because, I mean, really, uh, so what you're telling us, and again, the educational system, it's, it's a statist educational system. The educational system, they're not going to teach you that government's, you know, if it's, an, if it's a statist educational system, they're not going to teach you that government's bad. They're going to mm-hmm. teach you that, hey, trust us, we, we'll take care of you. Ronald Reagan had something else to say about that, of course. Uh, that, uh, you know, if, if it's the government's promising to trust you, you probably, they are the cause of the problems rather in many cases. You know, even Richard, this summer I was in Portugal with, uh, with my wife's hometown and meeting up with some of her friends who are decidedly to the left side of the political spectrum, to say the least. And even they acknowledge the fact that governments can be the most harmful thing in our lives. They can be the most devastating, the most damaging, the most dangerous entities that exist. So even they understand that, but... They still, I think, don't see the necessity uh, so much of the Portuguese remaining Portuguese and the Italians, Italians, the Germans, the Germans, the French, the French. They, I think they're, say, they're seeing in sort of the, what you were talking about, this notion of remaining safe and trying to avoid the horrors of war. Meantime, though, uh, one wonders, and now uh, Europe is being infected with, uh, with various other problems, and they're having their little skirmishes everywhere, aren't they? Yeah, right. Um, it's... To me, um, what it all boils down to, and, and I really hate to say this, but it, it's true, is civilization now around the world is in decline because these economic systems that have been forced onto us don't work. Uh, and, and the fascinating thing to me is that the Soviet Union was the embodiment, uh, the epitome of this uh, socialist central planning model where the government owns and controls everything and everybody and tells everybody what to do and makes sure that everything is done the way the government wants it done, that's socialism. And that right. was tried in the Soviet Union, and it totally fell apart. And the people who are still advocating it pretend like it didn't happen. Their model was tested thoroughly in the Soviet Union, and it led to horrible catastrophe. And and yet... They, they they pretend like, well, you know, <laughs> it was just bad luck or something that, that yeah. killed the Soviet Union. But it wasn't. It was socialism. Right. Yeah. Well, there's no understanding of that. There's very little understanding of that. And you, you talked about the uh, sort of the moral decay, the moral decline. And uh, this might actually be a good time to bring up one of your efforts uh, in terms of ethics, you you have a program going now to try to help people understand and, and perceive, you know, the people they come in contact with. Are they ethical? Are they somebody you can trust or not? Because, uh, and that's a, that's a talk a little bit about your program um, on ethics that you have going, and it's, a, it's sort of an educational um, effort that you have going. Talk to our listeners about that because I think that really gets to the heart of this notion of how people are treating each other. I mean, socialism is a system in which you are forced at gunpoint to give to somebody you don't know. Uh, I mean, the whole thing is just immoral, I think. Yes, absolutely. And and it's my belief that that essentially what's wrong with the world is that that we've lost the concept of ethics, and that enables governments to just go run run wild, do anything they want. Um, But it, it... it affects us most so far in our daily lives, just in our relationships with other people, especially in companies where mm-hmm. ethics is so important. Uh, it's the fundamental part of teamwork. So, you know, what happened was in uh, for about 125 years, the public school teachers used McGuffey's readers to teach ethics in the public schools. 
and uh, McGuffey's readers were were a series of books that contained all sorts of of uh, fascinating lessons about ethics, and the um, the ki- the whole population was taught ethics through McGuffey's readers. But in mm-hmm. the 1960s, McGuffey's readers were banned because they had some stuff in there about religion, and it's it's unconstitutional to teach religion in the public schools. So. Um, the teaching of ethics disappeared from the schools starting in the 1960s, and there are very few people around now who have a systematic understanding of ethics. It's a really very simple thing, but they don't have it. And so um, research shows that a third of young people, um, as well as millions of much older adults, do not know how to tell the difference between right and wrong. Mm. So what yeah. we've done is established a company called Ethics Solutions, um, and the, the uh, URL is ethicssolutions.net, um, and that teaches the ethics. There's a training course, um, and it costs $49, and um, you can put a young person or uh, an employee through the course in about two and a half hours. And it gives them the ethics that McGuffey's readers once took six years to teach. Teachers <laughs> usually took six years working with those readers to teach the ethics. But we've got it compressed down so that it can be done in two and a half hours. And then a person is tested after they do the studying. And when they pass the test, they're issued a certificate that shows that they do have a good working knowledge of ethics. Mm-hmm. And um, we're expecting, um, well, we've already got quite a few businesses that are using that to train their employees. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we're hoping that that catches on with also with parents wanting to teach their adolescents because the kids aren't going to get it in school. Yeah. It's got to come from someplace else. Um, well, and we're kind of expecting that, that perhaps the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts might use it. We don't really know where it will go, but essentially there's this enormous ethical vacuum out there, and we are now starting to fill it. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's really great that you're working on that, uh, Rick. You know, I think somebody once said, or somebody once said, I say it, and I know it's true, and I know you do know it's true as well, that uh, you, know, you, you need to demonstrate ethics the way you behave uh so you know don't don't do as i don't do as i do do as i say well no that doesn't work you have to parents have to live the way they teach their kids to live if they really want their kids to live that way so if we're going to look at our leaders in this in this country right now we look at the uh, the specter of a, of a clinton or a trump presidency my goodness what kind of ethics are those people teaching us <laughs> None whatsoever. <laughs> I mean, I mean the, uh, basically, they're teaching us steal if you can get away with it. The yeah. Federal Reserve is teaching us rob anybody you can get away with. If you don't get caught, it's just fine. Just mm-hmm. you know, just steal and take from whoever you can get away with, right? And I mean, aren't yeah. we being taught that essentially by the actions of the leaders of our country? Oh yeah, um, you know, I mean, I think I think Americans are really pulling their heads out of the sand now, and they're beginning to realize that what a, a an election is is just a way of buying power. The politician stands up in front of people and says, if you will give me the power, I'll steal from your neighbor and give you whatever you want. Yeah, that, That's essentially what it's all about. The whole process is crooked as a dog's hind leg. Yeah, and the problem is, of course, now uh, there's more and more people that are being stolen from, and there's, you know, of course, I guess it, it is true now, though, that in America there's slightly more people that are voting for a living than working for a living with the demographics. So it's uh, it's hard to see how we get out of this, uh, Rick. You know, I guess we got, uh, my engineer is telling me we have four minutes left. So let's say, let's take a couple of minutes and talk about uh, the prospects of a Trump presidency. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I, mean, I, I have, I'm very doubtful that that can happen because i think the establishment will make sure it doesn't one way or another uh, even if the people want him um trepidation about the possible trump presidency on your part yeah i've got a whole lot of trepidation but i've got slightly more trepidation about a clinton presidency <laughs> right well, that's I'm my that's scared of that. both of them right um, i think they're both a, a good example in in different ways 
about what political power does to something. What's really fascinating to me about Trump is that I thought that he was acting. You know, if you look back over a year or so, and you see how he's behaved since then, I thought that was all an act, because how could the guy become so um, uh, wealthy, so successful, um, and be that kind of person that he was putting on? And and, um, I realize now, after we've seen him in one of the debates, that he wasn't acting. That's the real guy. He wasn't yeah. just playing to an audience to get them to vote for him. That's the real guy. And I think what's going on here is that Clinton is a experienced politician, and as she gets closer to the White House, she gets just as giddy as he does, but she knows how to hide it. Yeah, exactly. And he, uh, that's, that's, Yeah. Yeah, I, I think... They're both in this emotional state where they can see that they've got a realistic possibility of being emperor of the world. And that's what the U.S. president is, not just president of the U.S. He's emperor of the world. And that amount of power, when they get to thinking about it, they get weird, man, really weird. And um, she knows how to hide it, but he doesn't. You know, Rick, in uh, uh, your August newsletter, you said it, I quote, It isn't so much Clinton who is on trial as it will be the American system itself. Uh, If and this is relating to her emails, and if she's not prosecuted for that, can can you just explain? Take a minute or so to explain what you meant by that. Sure, I I was in the military, and I know what happens to people who break security precautions, and and you don't want to do that. (laughs) It's going to be nasty, and 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 I'm entirely certain that if you or I. Um, did the security breaches that she did, we'd be in jail so fast it, it'd make your head spin. So um, she is a really dangerous person. She really, really wants to abuse power. She wants to. That's her record here. And the, if the American people are going to elect her um, and knowing, you know, that she's made these security breaches and, and is very likely to have resulted in the deaths of a lot of American troops. Um, the Benghazi thing is just one example of that. Right. And I, I think if the American people elect her, that will show you how totally corrupt the American people are. We do hope that something good will come out of this, uh, and I know that you also have some positive things to say in your newsletter, so I hope people will uh, will subscribe. But one of the things we never got to today is your excellent track record in investments, and people need to know that Rick's not only about uh, history and geopolitics, but he also has a fantastic track record when it comes to investing. So uh, thanks so much for being with us, Rick. We'll hope to talk to you about that sometime in the near future. 